Hello everyone, so welcome back to my channel. Okay, so this time we shall continue with our self-paced learning materials and I will discuss to you the last topic of first law of thermodynamics before we move on to the second and third laws. Okay, so we are at the point where we can make our first analysis of an actual experiment. So I will explain the experiment first, then we will use the concepts of thermodynamics to show that the experiment is isoenthalpic, meaning constant enthalpy process. Just a little bit of information. It was these two guys here who did the experiment way back in 1852. So they conducted an experiment in which they pumped gas at a constant rate through a lead pipe that has a tiny opening or a constriction, or you can use the word orifice. Now the whole system is kept under adiabatic conditions so that no heat is transferred during the process. On the upstream side of the pipe, the gas was a ha at higher pressure than the downstream side of the pipe. Okay, so when I say upstream side, I refer to the left side of the pipe, and the downstream side will be the right side. Also in this experiment, the temperature of the gas was carefully monitored on either side of the pipe. So I will stop from here, and we will see the results of the experiments in the succeeding slides. We can actually remake the experiment using a better apparatus as shown in this slide. The apparatus itself is quite simple. Um, imagine a tube with a porous plate separating it into two parts. The porous plate will allow gas to go to pass through, but only slowly. So basically it acts as a throttle. On each side of the plate, there is a piston that fits the tube tightly. Now each piston can be, in principle, be pushed against the porous plate. The tube itself is insulated so, so that no heat can enter the or leave the tube. Imagine that some gas is placed between the porous plate on the piston on the left side of the tube. Now this is side one. On the other side of the piston is flush against the porous plate. This is side two. Now, during the experiment, gas is pushed through the porous plate by pushing on the piston on the left side. At the same time, the piston on the right side is pulled in such a way that the pressure on the right is always P2. Of course, P2 must be less than P1. At the end of the experiment, all the gas has been pushed through the porous plate. Now, the volume on the side one is zero. Now, the final volume on the right side, that is side two, is V2. The pressure is P2 and the temperature is P2. The curious result of this experiment is that careful measurement shows that P2 is not equal to P1. Under some conditions, it is higher and under, under other conditions, it is lower. Their observation in this experiment is that there was a cooling effect as the gas expanded from a region of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure. Also, it was observed that not all gases undergo cooling effect upon expansion. Some gases, such as hydrogen and helium, will experience a warming effect upon expansion. Now let us try to analyze the results of this experiment to see why this phenomenon happened. In order to do this, we have to analyze each step of the experiment. Let's try to consider what is happening on the left side of the pipe. This is before the actual process. Now, the initial volume of gas on side one is V1, and the pressure is P1, and temperature is P1. The process starts with volume V1, and it ends in a volume zero on the left side of the compartment. We know that work is negative P delta V, so the work done on the left side is given by this equation. So what happens in sides two? The process starts with volume two equal to zero and it ends with a certain volume V2. So the work done on the right side is given by this equation. The total work done is equal to the sum of the work during gas compression and gas expansion. Therefore, the total work will be given by this equation. Since the process is adiabatic, the total change in internal energy is just equal to work or U2 minus U1 is equal to P1 V1 minus P2 V2. We can rearrange the terms and notice that U plus PV is equal to enthalpy. 
we can thus say that the enthalpy on both sides during the process are equal. This condition is known as isoenthalpic. In the experiment, what is actually measured is a temperature change accompanying a pressure change under constant enthalpy. This is known as the Joule-Thomson coefficient, or we can use the Greek letter mu to denote this. The value of the Joule-Thomson coefficient can be negative or positive for a real gas. Now, at this point, I want you to remember this equation because we will use this in our succeeding derivations. The typical behavior of a joule thomson coefficient can be summarized in the figure shown in the slide. Consider the figure at the left. At the combinations of temperature and pressure for which the joule thomson coefficient is greater than zero, that means it's inside the shaded region, the sample will cool upon expansion. Along the boundary, the gas will undergo neither a temperature increase nor decrease upon expansion. At those pressures and temperatures conditions outside the shaded region where the joule thomson coefficient is less than zero, the gas will undergo a temperature increase upon expansion. For a given pressure, there are typically two temperatures at which the joule thomson coefficient can change sign, the upper and the lower inversion temperatures as shown in the right-hand figure. Okay. Let's try to summarize what we've learned so far. Again, please do remember the joule thomson equation shown in this slide. Consider the diagram shown in the right side. As the gas flows from the left to the right side through the porous plug under adiabatic conditions, we know that the enthalpy at both sides are equal. That is, the process is isoenthalpic. During the process, we also know that P1 is always greater than P2. But how about P1 and P2? Is it greater or is it smaller? Well, this depends on the joule thomson coefficient. Now let's try to analyze what will be the temperature for three cases, that is, when the joule thomson coefficient is greater than zero, less than zero, or if it's equal to zero. To do this, I will have to approximate this derivative shown here and write it as P2 minus P1 in the numerator and P2 minus P1 in the denominator. Again, this is a constant enthalpy. To see the relationship of P2 and P1 different joule thomson values, the trick here is to ar arrange the equation and rewrite the denominator as P1 minus P2. Why? Because this will give us a positive quantity. Again, we know that P1 is always greater than P2. Now, if joule thomson coefficient is greater than zero, then the term becomes positive, and if you subtract it to P1, then P2 is going to be less than P1. So when the joule thomson coefficient is positive, then we expect that P2 is less than P1. In some substances, the joule thomson coefficient is negative. So, if the joule thomson coefficient is negative, multiplied to the negative sign, this entire term here becomes a positive value. This makes P2 greater than P1. In other words, when the joule thomson coefficient is negative, then P2 is greater than P1. Now, we will later discuss why the joule thomson coefficient is zero for an ABL gas. Okay, before going any further, let's try to answer the typical problem. When a free in is used as in refrigeration was expanded adiabatically from an internal pressure of 32 atmosphere and 0 degrees Celsius to a final pressure of 1 atmosphere and the temperature fell by 22 Kelvin, calculate the joule thomson coefficient at 0 degrees Celsius, assuming that it remains constant over this temperature. To answer this, we should recognize that the joule thomson coefficient is the ratio of the temperature change to pressure change under isoenthalpic conditions. This equation is shown here. Notice that in the problem, it says that the temperature fell by a certain value. So we will write a negative sign in the, to denote the temperature drop in the denominator. Now, substituting the values, it should give us a joule thomson coefficient of 0 0.1 Kelvin per atmosphere. 
Okay, to finally end up this lecture, let's look at some of the important things that we've learned. First, is that the joule thomson expansion is considered to be an adiabatic process. Second, we know that this process of gas expansion, uh, the enthalpy remains the same, hence the process is actually isoenthalpic. Now, experimentally, what we are actually determining in a joule thomson experiment is the joule thomson coefficient, which is given in this equation. Now, we have to remember the values of joule thomson coefficient tells us something about the gas when they expand. For example, if the joule thomson is greater than zero, then gas cools upon expansion. If the joule thomson coefficient is less than zero, then the gas heats up or warms up during expansion. Now, the joule thomson coefficient for ideal gases is always zero.